Once released from prison, Alex finds that his old, comfortable life is no longer available to him. In his parents' flat, he is unfazed by the erotic female portraits on the walls. Shouldn't he be feeling ill as he did with the woman on the stage? And he gives away his unchanged aggression by swinging a fake punch near his father's face. Good to see you. Give him fit! Oh, ah, ah. Where is his Ludovico aversion to violent impulse? With gritted teeth, he leans aggressively over his father. Again, no Ludovico response. Isn't he supposed to feel ill at the mere thought of killing a fly? Sick to the very heart at the thought even of killing a fly! Squaring off face to face with Joe the Lodger, Alex stares fiercely, with his fist clenched for a good 15 seconds. He has a prolonged urge to hit Joe, but there's not even the slightest sign of a Ludovico sickness response until he raises his fist. It's an act. Alex is intelligent enough to know that hitting Joe will blow his cover, but his initial desire for violence was real and undiluted. So he fakes a sickness response to win sympathy. Joe rightly claims, well, Look, he's weeping now, but that's all his craft and artfulness. So Alex plays a guilt trip on his parents and leaves, Kubrick adding a comical twist to his phony victim performance via the use of weepy violins, overdramatic drum rolls and an over-the-top outburst of crying from mother. Right, I'm leaving now. You won't have a bit me no more. I'll make me own way. Thank you very much, but it lie heavy on your consciences. Next on to the Thames River. Alex keeps up his miserable act, clinging on to his bag of belongings like a pillow. He stops near the bridge for what appears to be a short space of time, but there are a handful of details that indicate that he has stood still for a much longer period before being approached by the beggar. The shot of Alex moving into position shows him looking up at the bridge. We then cut to a profile close-up in which he is looking down at the water, but we didn't see his head move. That's most likely a continuity error, right? Okay, I'll go with that. But let's go over the whole sequence, this time paying attention to the tide of the river. Alex approaches the bridge and looks up. In this shot, there are two rungs of the cylindrical bridge support columns visible above the water. We cut to a profile close-up of Alex. Another of the Thames bridges is visible from a distance, but the water level is much lower. We now cut to Alex's point of view of the water. As the shot zooms in, we can see that there are four rungs of the bridge supports now visible. The tide has dropped at least six feet from when Alex first approached the bridge. So we have several apparent continuity errors regarding Alex looking up and down and the level of the tide. And now comes the really big continuity error. This one even more blatant and unnecessary. We cut from Alex's point of view of the water and bridge support columns to an over-the-shoulder shot, and the beggar steps in. But the tide jumps from showing four rungs of the bridge support columns to showing just one. The tide has risen at a level that would take many hours. Was Kubrick so clumsy as to include at least four major visual errors in a space of less than 30 seconds in a sequence that has no dialogue? These errors could easily have been avoided by the inclusion of a few low angles that didn't show the river itself, yet the continuity of weather for the scene is perfect. The only way these errors could be achieved is if Kubrick combined shots filmed at completely different times of the day, or even on different days of the shoot. Considering these details in the wider context of Alex's phony Ludovico victim act, it makes much more sense that he has actually stood near the river for a very long period of time long enough for the tide to fall and rise again. Hoping that his now famous face will be recognised, hoping that the person who recognises him will assume he is going to throw himself in the river and thus bring media attention to the suffering plight of poor little Alex. And again, we have the over-the-top weepy violins playing. Eventually he is recognised, but not by someone sympathetic to his act. 
The beggars attack him, and, being unafraid of them in their aged weakness, Alex feigns his sickness response again, hoping that some sympathetic police officers will fall for the act instead. But his plan is thwarted again. The droogs he once bullied show up, and, in an interesting little detail, their collar numbers are 665 and 667. Alex, stood between them, would be 666, the mark of evil. And no, I'm not saying the film has a witchcraft or devil worship theme. I'm saying that Alex has been branded as evil for his past deeds and is thus punished. The beating and near drowning that Alex endures in the woods isn't staged, nor is his response an act. Now he really is suffering, and from here on the story progresses through a very different series of twists that veer far from the novel. But before we move into those, there are other clues offered in the film's marketing to indicate that Alex's humble narration is a pack of lies. This alternative poster artwork commissioned by Kubrick uses a glass of false teeth to symbolise Alex as the lying narrator. He also wore a long-nosed mask, a cultural sign of a liar, when invading the writer's house after lying about an accident. And a phallic variation on the long-nosed mask is a central feature of this alternative poster, featured in the Stanley Kubrick Archives book. Alex, as the lying narrator and unaffected Ludovico subject, consistently matches Kubrick's direction up until his suicide attempt. The entire sequence of scenes from when he enters the writer's house operates on a very different paradigm to the novel. I'm not going to delve too much into that aspect of the film in this video, as it's quite complex, but I'll offer some clues for your consideration. The sequence begins with a panning shot from the writer's desk that is identical to the one from earlier in the film. It's a mirror image shot, as indicated by the mirror newspaper that is positioned for us to see. An actual mirror prop now appears in the lounge, but there wasn't one the first time round. The writer talks to Alex twice, and in both conversations Alex is positioned directly between the writer and the mirror. The writer is also now in a wheelchair, which is paralleled by Alex being carried by the weightlifter. And as he moves into the mirror position, the motif of an internal conflict in the mirror is punctuated by the sound of thunder. Frank, I think this young man needs some help. My God, what's happened to you, my boy? And my last clue about this whole sequence with the wheelchaired writer is that after Alex loses consciousness in an extremely sudden and unconvincing manner, he awakens in an attic bedroom. Do you know anything about dreams? Something, yes. Do you know what they mean? Perhaps. Are you concerned about something? No, no, I'm not concerned really, but uh, I've been having this very nasty dream. Very nasty. It's like, um, well, when I was all smashed up, you know, and, and half awake and unconscious like, I kept having this dream. You know, like all these doctors were playing around with me Gulliver, you know, like the inside of my brain. I seem to have this dream over and over again. Do you think it means anything? <laughs> Patients who sustain the kind of injuries you have often have dreams of this sort. It's all part of the recovery process. Ah. If you'd like to know more about A Clockwork Orange's differences with the novel and the subliminal details used by Kubrick, then you'll find an extensive study of the film on my website at collativelearning.com. And if you're interested in any studies of other Kubrick films, there are plenty of them on my channel. Thanks for watching.